Gentlemen, I'll use the term loosely if you know him well enough. Dr. Dave Hepburn is going to speak about cannabis and cancer, the promise, potential, and practical possibilities. You know, I have to say that uh, what, a, what a great venue, regardless of uh, for, for a conference like this. I mean, this is gardens, this is a farmer's market. How appropriate is that? In fact, mistakenly, I wandered over into the farmer's market thinking that's where the conference was, and uh, I have to say, I ended up now with uh, 17 jars of kumquat chutney from the, grown in the wilds of Mississauga. I have uh, three lily lavender soap ca you know, candle sort of things, and I have a quilt made from the wild yak of the Peterborough nose hair yak. I, I don't know what I have, I just wandered the wrong place, but this is great. Now, when the organizers, in their wisdom, thought, well, you know, what are we going to do with this guy? He's a, he's a, uh, a kind of a wise quack, he's a humorist from BC, so he must know about cannabis, he's from BC. Uh, let's give him a topic, oh, cancer. Because there's nothing like humor and cancer that go together. It's, uh, it's not something you normally would suggest go together, it's sort of like Donald Trump and Mensa. It doesn't go in the same sentence or, you know, Leafs and Stanley Cup, whatever. But, so it is not a funny topic, but there is no topic like cancer that tends to bring out the magical peels of various fruits of some island in the South Pacific, usually Micronesia, that nobody's ever heard of, as a miracle cure for cancer. And it is so important that we eschew, let's see if I got the first one up there, you can't even see that. But it's so important that we eschew hyperbole and that we bring a voice of common sense to a, an area where it is easy to get off into this, you know, this great panacea that, ca that cannabis is. So many people have ideas that are loosely formed and firmly held and, and fiercely defended, and we need to make sure that we, that they're the loudest voices, that we, that we oppose that in all, everything that we do. So there is a slippery slope to the science, and it's important that that needs to be avoided. So is it snake oil? Okay, there's the snake oil. Does it, or does it cure cancer? And I suggest that we go right back to the very organizations who uh, are the most conservative and who would suggest uh, things like that, you know, we, this is a slippery slope to addiction and everything else. So this statement came out in June of 2015. Cannabis has been shown to kill cancer cells. That is from the National Cancer Institute of the National Institute of Health of the United States. Very conservative, uh, not apt to make claims like this. Furthermore, if we go deeper into the lion's den, and go to the, uh, those cannabis lovers, NIDA, the National Institute of Drug Abuse, they have, they have even said that whole plant marijuana, and if you go to their website, this is on their website now, can slow the growth of cancer cells in one of the most serious forms of brain tumors. So this is now NIDA, so now this is starting to gather some credibility. You're getting these conservative organizations who are admitting that there are, definitely is a role for cannabis in the world of cancer. And keep in mind that NIDA has historically looked at things from somewhat of a skewed perspective, shall we say. You know, most of us look at things straight on, they kind of look at the underbelly of things and saying, well, it's got to be an addictive thing. So the scientific community will typically roll their eyes at claims of miracle cures from plants and things of that nature. And we have to make sure, but they are, however, acknowledging the fact that there have been a lot of preclinical, observational, experimental, animal studies and now some clinical, that are in showing the promised potential and the possibilities that exist with cannabis in the world of cancer. Now let me ask you a question here. Be honest. How many of you out here, right now, have cannabis running in your bloodstream at this moment? You do. Wow. Oh my gosh. You, you, okay. You, your hand up? No. Your hand didn't go up back there, and I'll tell you right now, you're, you're not telling the truth, because you, you do have cannabis running in your seam. I say that because it is important to know that every one of us has cannabis in our bloodstream. And that is an important concept to understand if you want to know how cannabis works as a medicine. We have our own natural cannabis that we make, was referred to earlier by Dr. Tischler, that is in fact our endocannabinoids. And we are trying to harness that system 
The same way we do with Parkinson's and dopamine. The same thing we do with dementias and, and, and uh, acetylcholine and depressions and serotonin. We are trying to harness the endocannabinoid system to help us in, to be healthier, to see what it can do to help, to help us to have what's called endocannabinoid tone. Now, again, just to, uh, just to quickly summarize what it does, the endocannabinoid system is a series of, of what we call ligands or neurotransmitters, receptors and enzymes that work together to make, to bring us to a balance, to a homeostasis, to a, a middle ground where we are healthy. It helps us to eat, sleep, relax, protect, and forget important things. It also helps us to avoid vomiting all day long, to be in pain all the time, to have tremors. Uh, there are many, many things that this endocannabinoid tone is important for us to do. And when it gets out of whack, we have deficiency syndromes, which is a whole different story. But we are trying to harness this. You go on a cruise, you go on, typically you go on a cruise, you go on as passenger and you come off as cargo because you gained some weight on, on the cruises. But a few days later, a few weeks later, your weight comes back down to a normal thermostatic level. That is what our endocannabinoid system is meant to do. So again, you do not understand the endocannabinoid system, then you do not understand cannabis. So once again, this, is, this slide just simply shows that plant cannabis fits into the same receptors that our endogenous cannabinoids work with, not exactly the same and not always the same, but very often they do. So they're endocannabinoids on the left, in the middle, uh, on the right are the synthetic cannabinoids, the Marinols, the Sativexes, a new one called Syndrose, so it just came out about a month ago. And in the middle are the phytocannabinoids, the plant cannabinoids. I'm going to tell you that they are, in fact, medically turning out to be the most effective of the medicines, better than the synthetics, and very often, and particularly in the world of cancer, more effective than our own natural endogenous cannabinoid system, which is actually not that powerful when it comes to uh, anti-neoplastic effects and cancer effects. So that's important for you to, to understand. Now, for those of you from southern Alberta, this is cannabis. For those of you from BC, this is likely breakfast. So they're two different things. That actually was my breakfast, I can't lie. It was, lie. okay. I, I could tell by talking to you earlier. So this is, uh, but th it's not just this, there are many strains to it. I show you this picture because it shows the different strains and colors of a bud because it, it indicates that there are many, many different things. Pharmacologically, cannabis is a nightmare. Because there's 140 some odd cannabinoids, there's 400 some odd compounds if you add in the terpenes and flavonoids and other things. But if you see here, there's different things and they do different things to us. So it is, it is a real art to try, or in science, to try and suss out what does what. And that is part of what we're trying to do now. So it is, uh, and is it exactly the same? Are, plants, are the plants the same as our endogenous cannabinoids? By the way, this is, if we drill down, this is an amazing little drug factory. This is a trichome on a cannabis plant, and in that glandular top you see is where the drugs are made. This is a natural pharmacological factory right here. And you can tell this is medical because it looks like a golf ball on a tee, so it's gotta be beneficial. But it's, uh, but it's important to understand that the plant isn't exactly the same. It thinks it is, but the plant cannabinoids are not exactly the same as our endogenous cannabinoids. They live in the same neighborhood, so to speak, but they can act differently. The idea is we need to figure out and harness how that acts properly to enhance our own system, and that is the key. But the most important part of this is when we look at drugs, we look at safety, efficacy, tolerability, and cost. Now, the safety profile is massive. Nobody dies of cannabis because there are no receptors in the brainstem, at least in the respiratory part of the brainstem. There are no receptors there. And you have 80-some-odd people, 40, 43 a day in the United States dying of prescription opiates. And if you had non-prescriptions, it's over 80. But nobody dies of cannabis because there's no receptors in the brainstem. So the safety profile is absolutely massive. It's absolutely huge. Nobody dies of cannabis, which gives us a lot of a lot of room to work on this. And as you can see, in the case of overdose, poison control for most everything we have. In case of overdose for cannabis, and if you need an ambulance, uh, we use the modern technology to bring the ambulance to you. There's your treatment for most issues when it comes to cannabis here. So on to the world of cancer. I look at it in a couple different ways. I look at the micro effects and the macro effects. The micro effects are some of the things it does. We'll go back to the National Cancer Institute. And they have said, studies have shown that cannabinoids may inhibit tumor growth by three ways. One is causing cell death. That's called apoptosis or cellular suicide. One is blocking the cell growth, this anti-mitogenic effect. And one is blocking the development of blood vessels that go to the tumors, the anti-angiogenic effect. 
So there are three ways that cannabis actually works to affect a cancer cell. But the holy grail is in their last part of the statement from the National Cancer Institute, while protecting normal cells. That is essential. Right now, treatment in, in the world of cancer is surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation, so-called sl slash burn and poison. That's how we have to go after things nowadays. But we're gonna see in a moment here that cannabis can really mitigate the amount of all of those that are required in many of so some interesting studies for, and quoted from the National Cancer Institute and from NIDA. This is not from the School of Eastern Bohemian Hippie College or something. This is from major, major sources here. So these are important things that, that have to know. Now, I'm gonna show you this slide. Don't be intimidated by this slide. Actually, you know what? Go ahead and be intimidated by it because it's an intimidating slide. But if there's a couple of things I wanna point out. Number one, at the top, I don't know if there's a pointer on this or not, are, are the CB1 and 2 receptors. So this is a cancer cell. This happens to be a, a uh, GBM, a brain, a glioblastoma multiform, a brain tumor cancer cell, where most of the research, a lot of research has been done. And you see that there's those receptors on the membrane of the cell. Well, when cannabinoids act on them, I'm not going to bring you through this whole cascade, but you can see down here it says cell cycle arrest, down the bottom left. Cell cycle arrest. Now, normally when you think of arrest in cannabis, you're thinking of a completely different story. But this is arrest in a cell cycle. And the word at the bottom is a great word. It's called apoptosis. It's an excellent word. Just go ahead and use it today somewhere, you know, feel like a little apoptotic, whatever. It's a great word for Scrabble. But it's, apoptosis is cellular suicide. And so by going through this cascade, you induce cellular suicide in this cell, which is a cancer cell, while leaving the non-transformed non cells, the normal cells, alone. That again is the holy grail. This is remarkably promising and has, is very exciting, has great potential, as how cannabinoids affect that cell, right down to the very molecular and cellular level, right down even to the nuclear level. And the, you see these PPAR gammas and things. So it's really kind of fascinating how cannabinoids will work on this tumor cell. Now, if this was a breast tumor cell or a prostate cancer cell, it's a completely different mechanism of receptors, of cannabis receptors, which is kind of fascinating. It's extremely fascinating, and it's important to know. But the science is progressing, and it is exciting, and of course it's been hamstrung by 70 years of, uh, of being a, an evil drug, according to our NIDA friends. Again, back to National Institute of Health. A lab study of CBD and estrogen receptor positive and estrogen receptor negative breast cancer cells showed that it caused cancer cell death while having little effect on the normal breast cells. And, and then it talks about metastasis. Now, the bad thing about cancer, what makes, a, what makes a tumor bad is if it spreads. So this also reduces the spread of cancer cells. So it prevents metastasis. It reduces the size and growth of tumors, which is massively important. And the other thing is it potentiates the effect of other therapies. So I mentioned slash burn and poison that we use, and you know, if the only thing tool you have is a hammer, then everything looks like a nail. So you're using this, you're, you're, you're using your chemo, that's what you're focused on. But what happens is studies have now shown, uh, very exciting studies, that radiation, by the way, this is NIDA, they think they're the watchdogs, but if you look closely, you can really see what's up, what they're up to. They're not, they're not so important, but they, they have shown that when used with radiation, THC and CBD actually potentiate the effect of the radiation to the point that in some cases they shrunk the tumor cells 10 times what the normal treatment would have done. 10 times that a point. This was a study done out of the St. George's College in London. And it was really quite remarkable to see, again, this is not yet on patients. This is on things like mice and rats and lawyers and things like that, but not humans. So this is, this is what happens with this, with uh, currently the radiation, not just the radiotherapy, also, also the uh, chemotherapy. So there's a drug called temozolomide. It's a, it's a common drug used in the treatment of brain tumors, or temo. And, and what was, now this is an actual human study, and this is a remarkable study, because uh, there's very few human studies now, but this is one done in Spain and in Europe that showed that when you used temozolomide alone, on this very aggressive tumor that normally in one year only 53% survive, which is better than if you use nothing. When adding 
a combination CBD and THC, after one year, 83% survival, which in the world of cancer is huge. The average lifespan, once the recurrent GBM has been diagnosed, is, uh, is the average lifespan is 368 days. When you added CBD and THC, it was over 550 days. Those may seem like small gains, they're massive in the world of cancers. So it's important. In palliative care, the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, Medicine in January issued a 400-page document report. And in that, they documented three, th three things in particular that were substantive and cl conclusive evidence. And one of them had to do with the effects of, uh, not of, cancer, of cannabis with cancer-related symptoms, treatment sy symptoms, like, like nausea and vomiting in particular. And it's true that it is really effective, we know, in the palliative care, so much so that a study of 4 million patients in the United States showed that there was a 56% reduction in patients with cancer who were on cannabis who died at home as opposed to who died in hospice. So that is a remarkable number, not just economically, but you think of the reasons people go into hospice. It's for pain control, it's for anxiety, it's for nausea and vomiting, it's for fear. And these things were tolerated so much better with, with cancer that 56% increase in patients who were able to, to die at home. Again, that is neat. And, and, and as a friend of mine said, if the worst thing is that you're sick with a, you know, as the nausea, if you're sick with a smile, is that the worst thing ever? No, it's not. There is more to be revealed. Now, some of it perhaps not exactly what we want to be revealed, but once again, the signs are pointing to some very good things. But how the signs are interpreted is important. As sometimes we go on faith, and sometimes we want to, you know, ask the waiter to taste his, the cake first. But you do a disservice to the science when you say things like this, because it does not. Instead, you say things like this, cannabis versus cancer. So what can you do? Well, you can be informed to the point that you can, uh, I, I feel, be a common sense voice rather than a, a shrill voice of fanaticism on one side or another, but be the sense be the voice of common sense that you bring to this, bring the voice of science, and mix it, and don't eschew it, and, and, and wave banners that we see in, in the islands of British Columbia all the time. We need to stare down the biased face of regulators who make research so difficult, and who have put us deliberately between the horns of a dilemma. And we need to realize that the efforts we make may have a trickle-down effect that can affect and make these regulators look to be the creatures that they are. Now, I was told that many folks here are coming today for a trophy thing, uh, trophy guy, trophy. So I was told, you know, it's all about trophies this time. So I want to say I'm excited that you're here about the trophy, but this is my seventh grade spelling bee trophy I won in Mrs. Hornbuckle's class. So I'm glad you come for that. I'll be signing autographs after with some other guy, I guess. But uh, I'm glad to be able to do this here. And I'll be back here for the panel that we do later, Craig. Thanks very much. Uh, can you spell Hornbuckle? Ladies and gentlemen, Dave Hepper. Oh.